everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today to our discussion um, about remembering or misremembering the, the 1990s. Um, we are, well, I am in particular, but we're all very lucky to be joined um, by an excellent, an excellent panel to discuss this, this time. Um, and in particular, the shadows um, that it continues to cast over Russia's political imagination, its understanding of itself um, in the post-Soviet context and its understanding of, of the world. Um, over the last 10 years, the Kremlin's been very skilled um, and its supportive media have been very skilled at instrumentalizing um, what were often quite traumatic memories and narratives um, during the first post-Soviet decade. And I think as well, that's an aspect that's not quite how traumatic it was is an aspect that's not always very well understood in the West. And so I'm very pleased to be able to um, discuss this issue, discuss you know, what the West doesn't understand, how the 1990s is remembered and misremembered, and why that memory is so powerful and is so usable um, for state media and politicians. So to join me and to, to help me do that, um, I'm very happy to be joined um, first by um, Olga Malinova, who's a professor at the School of Politics and Governance um, at um, HSC University, it's the High School of Economics um, in Moscow, and she joins us today um, from Moscow as well. So you wrote probably, um, well, not probably, definitely the article um, on this topic of um, the 1990s in memory for a special issue um, that came out, I think it was last year, it could have been 2020, the, the, the pandemic sort of blends all the years together, but I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, her insights. I'm also looking forward to hearing insights from Will Paul, who's the Frederick C. Dirks Professor of International Economics at, at Middlebury College, um, so of this of this parish. Um, and um, also I'm looking forward to, also of this parish, I'm looking forward to hearing from Michael Kimmich, who's a Professor of History at the, the Catholic University of America, so we have um, three quite different perspectives. And of course, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Jade McGlynn. I work at the, I'm a senior researcher focusing on Russia, uh, also focusing on, on memory, um, largely, and uh, Russian media um, at the Monterey Initiative in Russian Studies. And with that, I'm just going to make a couple of points on housekeeping, which is this event will last one hour. And if you would like to, um, to ask any questions, please do pop them in the chat. We, um, we always like to get questions from the audience. And they often help to take the discussion in interesting and sometimes unexpected ways. Um, but on that note, um, I will I will start with my first question and and to the speakers. Um, so, Will, could I, if I could start with you, um, would you be able to just summarize for us the economic reality of the 1990s for for most ordinary Russians? Was it this time of unbridled freedom and opportunity, or or was it a bleak time of, of poverty and desperation, or, or both? Well, thank you, Jade. It's it's an honor to be here with you and with Olga and, and Michael. Um, the short answer to your question, I think, is is both. Uh, the 1990s were a decade of, of new freedoms and opportunities, but they also brought great economic hardship. Um, in the fall of, of 1991, just before the Soviet Union broke apart, Boris Yeltsin was putting together his economic team led by the young economist Yegor Gaidar, and Gaidar and his colleagues saw themselves like kamikaze pilots. They wanted to introduce reforms quickly and dramatically. They wanted to liberalize prices, make the ruble convertible, and um, begin the privatization of, of Russian industry. Yeltsin went along with that and spoke about a, a necessary six months of pain for the population, six months of economic adjustment. But the economic pain, uh, the adjustment period lasted in the end, the entire decade, average household income plummeted and, and only bottomed out in, in 1998. I, in, in retrospect, I think it's fair to say that so long as Russia was committed to dismantling the communist system and joining the global economy, a collapse of that magnitude was almost inevitable. In 1991, on the eve of reform, Russia had thousands of firms, particularly in its bloated manufacturing sector, that simply weren't ready for markets. They'd been insulated from international competition for decades, and they just didn't have the wherewithal. They didn't have the technologies to produce products that would make that would be market competitive. A lot of adjustments, a lot of restructuring had to take place. 
manufacturing had to be downsized, the service sector had to be um, had to grow, uh, the military industrial complex had to be scaled back. And as the economy went through all those structural adjustments, average Russians suffer. It's true that certain consumer goods became more widely available, cars, personal computers, for example. Um, and it's true that some took advantage of the new freedoms to start their own businesses, but many Russians uh, were losing their jobs. Unemployment climbed from effectively zero to 10% in the 1990s. And many more Russians saw their work hours cut and their wages paid late. Over 40% of working age adults changed jobs permanently between 1991 and 1998, many being forced to um, what's called downshift into careers that didn't take full advantage of the skills they'd accumulated over a lifetime. These were individuals who before the 1990s had come to expect and, and take comfort in the certainty of guaranteed lifetime employment with no worry about losing a job or being forced to change careers. Experiencing wage cuts, worrying about wage cuts, losing jobs, worrying about jobs, all that took a tremendous toll on Russians. Materially and, and maybe even more psychologically, stress levels went up, happiness, reported subjective well-being levels went down. There's some very convincing research that's been published uh, recently by one of Olga's HSE colleagues that shows that those who were suffering, suffering in the job market in the 1990s suffered in terms of their health, both in the short and long run. We also know that Russia experienced a very real demographic crisis in the early 1990s. The average life expectancy at birth declined six years for men and three years for women between 1991 and 1994. Outside of wartime and pandemics, those numbers, they're unprecedented in an industrialized society. By comparison, COVID uh, in the United States has only uh, resulted in a decline in life expectancy of between one and two years. Life expectancy was declining because mortality rates, particularly for men in their prime working years, were going up dramatically. The death rate for men between 35 and 44 doubled between 1989 and 1994. Cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, and such grew the fastest as a cause of death. Uh, but suicide rates spiked as well, and certain age groups were among the highest in the world. Now, it's been difficult for researchers to draw definitive conclusions as to what was driving the increase in mortality rates, but there's a consensus uh, that's formed around stress tied to labor market uncertainty and increased alcohol consumption. Rapidly increasing inequality was another important economic feature of the 1990s. Russia today is, is one of the most unequal societies in the world, particularly in terms of the distribution of wealth. Uh, we all know that. But it's important to note that by many of the metrics that economists use to assess inequality in a society, the level of inequality in Russia has been more or less stable since 2000. The 1990s, however, saw huge increases in the amount of income going to and the amount of wealth held by the top 1%. And much of that wealth going to the new economic elite was flaunted conspicuously in a way that was really jarring for average Russians who've been brought up to value the socialist commitment to economic equality. So to come back to your question, Jay, the 1990s produced a lot of suffering and pain in Russia. The decade, you could say, damaged the brand of liberal market capitalism in Russians' eyes. In 2006, the, the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, did a, a survey of households across uh, all the post-communist countries in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, asking them questions, including one on their thoughts about the best way to organize the economy. And in Russia, uh, the response, the, an economy based on markets and private property was the least popular, the least popular of any post-communist country. Considering the sort of very brief summary you've given there is perhaps perhaps not, not that surprising, sort of the, that final note. I think um, even as, as someone who thinks that you know the difficulties of the 1990s are, are very understated that they're not uh, in, in western discourse that they're not discussed enough even still to hear it all kind of laid out like that um 
it's just such a reminder of what a, a deeply unsettling time it must have been but also as well I think personally as, as you, you talked about there with the downshifting of of jobs that that perhaps drop in status which I know is something that 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 comes up um that comes up quite a lot actually even in in my discussions with people about um the current war um in in Ukraine it's sort of often things come back to this fall of the Soviet Union in the, the 1990s and, and the West um and, and on that note, I suppose, since I think they are connected, this sort of personal humiliation, um, Michael, how would you say this personal humiliation was, was matched um, by um, a sense of geopolitical humiliation, so, or, or a feeling, a feeling of geopolitical humiliation, and, and what lingering effects has that feeling had? So, so four points I would make in response to your question, Dave, and thank you so much for the invitation to join this very distinguished uh, panel this morning, this afternoon, this evening, from <laughs> wherever you're, to, you're tuning in. Um, the first point I would make has, has nothing to do with humiliation, uh, and it's that uh, the 1990s witnesses the birth uh, of the most Russian Russia in modern Russian history. So relative to the Soviet Union and to the Russian Empire, Boris Yeltsin's Russia after 1991 uh, is something really very new. It's still multi-ethnic and, and multi-confessional. Uh, but it's not the sprawling empire uh, that had preceded it in Soviet times uh, and Imperial Russian times. And I think that's a very significant circumstance for the foreign policy of Russia, for society, for politics, uh, for self-conception. Uh, granted, you know, all of the challenges that Will just mentioned a moment ago are immediately imposed upon that uh, new state and new society. Um, but I think there's actually a narrative of something coming into being, something rising up, uh, something crystallizing and something forming, uh, which is very important to the story uh, of, uh, of the 1990s. The second point I would make uh, is that, and you know, I wouldn't want to generalize too radically about this because I think all across the former Soviet Union, even today, there are different kinds of nostalgia uh, and different kinds of regret about, about the breakup of the uh, of the Soviet Union. But this is, of course, most powerful and most intense in the Russian Federation because, unlike almost every other part of the former Soviet Union, that sort of story of liberation, take the easy counterexample that Lithuania tells the story of its independence, as it will say, uh, its constitution as a nation very much in opposition to the Soviet story, uh, that functions differently in the Russian Federation. So, there, I think humiliation may be a little bit less relevant than the word loss that um, in the Russian Federation, the loss of the Soviet Union is experienced much more as a loss than uh, elsewhere in the former Soviet Union. That plays into domestic politics, certainly, but has very important resonances for foreign policy. You see the, you know, the sort of con contested Lenin statues uh, in the war in Ukraine today that they're sort of knocked down by uh, the Ukrainians and put back up by the uh, by the Russian army. And, you know, we could have a long discussion about the uh, symbolism of the Soviet Union in the current war, but that's just one of the ways in which the past of the 1990s connects to the, uh, to the present. Third point about the humiliation, uh, you know, I think it's very uh, important to note in some ways how peculiar 1991 was as a transition point. Uh, it was not the defeat of Imperial Germany uh, in 1918, uh, where you had a conscious will, you know, being discussed in terms of Emmanuel Macron's phrase that the West should humiliate Russia in the present day, but it's a conversation now that goes back to the First World War. And there was then a will to humiliate Germany, and that came in the form of the Versailles Treaty and reparations that were forced upon uh, post World War I Germany. That was not the case in the 1990s. I do not think that there was a conscious will on the part of a united Germany or the United States or France or Britain to humiliate post-Soviet Russia. If anything, there was a sense of gratitude that there is a post-Soviet Russia. Instead, that sense of humiliation followed from a very real set of circumstances uh, that were too bold in nature that, uh, you know, I think Will has already, you know, said everything that needs to be said about the Russian economy. It's a much diminished economy uh, from what the economy of the Soviet Union was, you know, military modernization, uh, retrenchment, all of that was expensive, uh, but it was also, a military that was, you know, dramatically less effective uh, and had far fewer means available to it than uh, the Soviet military did. So Russia, in an objective fashion, lost a lot of clout. If it would compare itself to the Soviet Union, which it often did, uh, it seemed like a much lesser uh, 
force in the world. And how could that not be uh, humiliating? The United States is, is struggling with an adjustment vis-a-vis -vis China to a sort of relative decline in its economic and military power. Uh, and I don't know if humiliation is the perfect word, but uh, <clears throat> you know, there's the comparable emotions that uh, are expressed in that transition. Fourth and final point uh, is that all of this, the humiliation, the sense of loss, and the resurgence uh, of something that was newly Russian in the 1990s raises a very difficult question uh, of borders. Uh, and you do have the circumstance much noted by Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, that Russians, ethnic Russians, however one you want to characterize them, are in quotation marks stranded in the Baltic Republics, in Belarus, uh, and of course in Ukraine. Uh, and so I think the incentive for Russian elites and perhaps the Russian population as well to accept the existing borders. That the very thing on which Western policy is premised in Europe, the sacrosanct Helsinki Final Act, finished question of Europe's borders, uh, that's a linchpin of Western foreign policy. It is not a linchpin uh, of Russian foreign policy, uh, not only because of humiliation, because of the different kinds of uncertainty. And so I would here draw a very important line from the unfinished question of where Russia begins and ends in the 1990s to the jubilation in Russia about the annexation of Crimea uh, in 2014. Only because of the uncertainty over borders could you have a reaction like that and could you have such a different reaction in the West when it came to Crimea as a violation of international law uh, and something that went completely uh, in the wrong direction. So there too, I think there are echoes or parallels between past and present that are well worth exploring. But it makes me, the immediate thing I think of, I suppose, if, if um, I were to adopt Russian narratives in particular, would be to think about Kosovo there um, and 1999, because you're talking about the borders. And of course, that's something that comes up a lot and that's been spoken about um, was, you know, relatively frequently at the start of um, the Russian military action in Ukraine um, and the invasion of Ukraine, I mean, the one in, in February um, of this year. Um, as a sort of reference point of, okay, well, the West used to be um, going around sort of changing borders, um, you know, illegally, and and now, you know, and now we can do it, sort of this, this, um, this weird sort of paradoxical, that was a terrible thing to do, which is why we're going to do it now, um, sort of logic that you, that you sometimes get, but that I think was, that is sort of more of a statement about, about, um, an end to that era of, of being, if not humiliated, then certainly underestimated or ignored or, or overlooked on the on the geopolitical on the geopolitical stage. Um, of course, from the Kremlin's um, perspective, but of course, a lot of this discussion, even this discussion, discussion and the use of the word humiliation, of course, that's all about um, a matter of, of perspective, and uh, it feels like a good time um, to turn to Olga to ask, um, you know, sort of how how what techniques has the the state or and and supportive media used to sort of fuse this sense of of geopolitical um, humiliation with with personal humiliation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to this uh, discussion, and uh, I think we'll end Michael for a perfect uh, introduction to the problem of the 1990s. Uh, as answering your question, Jade, uh, I think we need to differentiate between uh, two things, uh, perception of the experience of the 1990s by people, and political uses of uh, their memory about this traumatic past. And I should say that uh, both things had their own dynamics. Uh, so uh, the answer depends uh, on from which point uh, in time I, I'm trying to give this answer. Uh, first of all, uh, we should uh, 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 remember that um, uh, the negative framing of the experience of the 1990s uh, at mass level uh, came uh, late. Uh, it was uh, visible in sociological service uh, in the 2000s, in mid 2000s. And if we take sociological service of the 1990s, uh, they were uh, much more positive about this experience. Oh, much more heterogeneous, I would say. There were much more different uh, opinions, including positive, negative, uh, you know. Uh, so we can say that this qualification of the 1990s as terribly hot actually took shape retrospectively. And it looks like uh, elites uh, uh, contributed to this framing a, a lot, 
and uh, um, so we should look at both uh, dynamics of mass opinion and dynamics of elite discourse. Uh, and uh, if we speak about humiliation, uh, then it should be said that um, uh, this idea of uh, interpreting the 1990s uh, as humiliation uh, at first came not from Kremlin. Uh, it, it came from uh, national patriots, uh, people who now often call themselves conservatives, and also from the communists. Uh, these groups um, during 1990s uh, uh, produced this discourse and the idea of humiliation was their idea originally. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, media and in particular TV uh, uh, played, uh, uh, also contributed greatly to shaping this idea of humiliation. And um, we have uh, a nice book of Gulnaz Sharfudinova who uh, studied uh, talk shows of uh, mid 2000s, uh, demonstrating how uh, media elite uh, contributed to shaping this negative vision of the 1990s. Uh, and uh, there is Maroon research uh, that uh, was uh, an analysis of a uh, great amount of Putin's speeches. Actually, I tried uh, to take into account every speech that is available uh, at the official website. And um, uh, Myself, as well as Gulnas uh, Sharafuddinova, we uh, and uh, some other researchers actually, we demonstrated that for Putin, uh, political uses of the 1990s was very important. It was uh, his important, uh, an important tool of, of legitimizing his authority. And uh, uh, from uh, his coming to the president office first as uh, executing uh, pres president, um, uh, after uh, Yeltsin's uh, 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 leaving his uh, this position, uh, from the very beginning uh, he addressed uh, the traumatic experience of the 1990s, and uh, the way he did it was uh, to make a contrast between then and now. Uh, the main idea was. Uh, uh, constructing the opposition between bad times that we are now living uh, in the past and uh, new times that uh, come with coming Putin's coming to power. Uh, and I would say that this was uh, in the very beginning the main idea of Putin's discourse about the 1990s. Uh, as for the issue of geopolitical humiliation, uh, I should say that uh, this idea uh, is uh, central for uh, Putin speaking about the 1990s now. Uh, I mean, after uh, February 24th. Uh, I found three speeches in which he addressed uh, this experience. Uh, by the way, he spoke about the 1990s and the beginning of 2000s, which is also typical for his uh, rhetoric. And uh, the issue of humiliation was central for, 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 all, for all three speeches. Uh, was this topic uh, peculiar for him earlier? I would say yes, from time to time, of course, he uh, addressed this uh, geopolitical reality and uh, he was critical towards the West. But I would say that the main, the main emotion uh, that he expressed uh, on this occasion was not uh, emotion of humiliation. It was a kind of ressentiment. For Putin, uh, the most uh, traumatic fact uh, about the 1990s was that, uh, according to his interpretation at that time, uh, Russia was uh, very open to collaboration with the West. Um, Russia expected that uh, it, it will be accepted as, as, as an equal partner. And this didn't happen. And this is rather frustrating for uh, Russian political elite. Uh, this is widely shared uh, feeling, uh, and Putin expresses it quite well. Thank you, thank you, Olga, um, for those for that those clarifications in particular as well, and and how um, the discourse kind of grew um, out of the the national patriots and the communists, but then came to be adopted um, more and more, and sort of to take um, 
up to a point where it's taken quite a prominent position um, recently. And I think we'll return as well to that question of, of how it's being used um, right now uh, towards the end of our discussion. But Will, I'd just like to turn to you now, because I know this is something that, that you've written about and researched, and to ask sort of why um, this state media or Putin himself sort of framing of the 1990s with this emphasis on instability, um, and of the yes, idea of sort of bad times, why does that resonate with the Russian Russian public so 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 well? Well, I think that uh, the main reason why it resonated so well was uh, well described by uh, uh, Will Pyle in the beginning of our discussion, because uh, it really was um, uh, a traumatic experience. It was uh, traumatic in different ways. Of course, uh, different people had a different part of this experience, uh, but it was something that really united uh, Russian society. Everybody had this experience. Everybody had something to be sorry about, uh, in this decade, everybody had some loss, lo has some losses. You see this, so this feeling of losses was something that really united people. Uh, it, it is also a matter of identity construction. I think that uh, Gulnaz Sharafuddinova's book, uh, which I have already mentioned, uh, demonstrated, demonstrated brilliantly. Actually, Putin was uh, very uh, skillful uh, in, constructing Russian identity by addressing this traumatic experience. I think that uh, uh, also theory of political myth uh, explains very well uh, why um, Putin was, uh, Putin's addressing uh, negative uh, experience of the 1990s was so appealing to people uh, because uh, it provided them uh, some, uh, you know, some uh, some some sense of um, recognition, some sense of recognition of their losses from from the authorities, uh, and uh, it was really very important. Besides, I think it also was a matter of uh, expectation of better uh, life, and uh, the construction of opposition between uh, the nine the bad nineteen difficult 1990s and uh, some, some uh, getting better life uh, in the 2000s uh, also was important part uh, of this talk. Uh, you're right, uh, Putin uh, himself uh, addressed this issue quite uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, in my article I, uh, that you have mentioned, I, I, I uh, demonstrate that um, reminding about the 1990s was a, a permanent feature of his rhetoric. Uh, he did it a lot. And uh, I tried to differentiate between uh, speeches that were clearly pre-prepared and those that were part of some discussion, some dialogue with uh, other people and uh, uh, so Putin spoke uh, somehow spontaneously. And I found that over years, actually uh, starting with his second term, uh, mentioning about the 1990s in the spontaneous parts of his speeches uh, prevailed over uh, pre-prepared, which means that it was really very important for him. Uh, by the way, uh, from this point of view, it's, it's rather strange or rather, uh, remarkable, I would say, uh, that after 24th of February, there are very few mentions about the 1990s. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, it's because uh, this construction of opposition between difficult 1990s and, and stable 2000s is now not evident anymore. But uh, I, I believe that we shall come uh, back to it later. There is one more point that I would like uh, to uh, emphasize now. I think that uh, the answer why uh, the construction of the negative memory about the 1990s was so successful uh, also lies uh, in the fact that there were no a uh, powerful counter narrative or counter discourse uh, to it. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, people who probably could be uh, a kind of defenders of a positive memory about the 1990s uh, 
were not interested in doing this job. Uh, I uh, also did analysis of the discourse of uh, the liberals and very surprising that uh, in the 2000s when uh, this uh, tendency to uh, political using, politically using uh, negative uh, aspects of the 1990s became rather evident. The liberals did not uh, try to resist by uh, reminding public about uh, positive aspects about the 1990s. And actually it was because they uh, honestly did not think that the 1990s were good time. They, they were also very critical uh, to Yeltsin's period. And it looks like they were very much preoccupied by justifying their own policy in the 1990s. Uh, so one part of the liberals uh, were preoccupied with justifying Igor Gaidar's reforms uh, and argued that everything was done correctly and it was good and uh, we actually benefited uh, from it. And another part of the liberals like uh, Grigory Yevlinsky uh, repeated uh, that uh, it was wrong way, and actually it were we, uh, Grigory Yevlinsky and his party, who proposed better reforms. So they were so much preoccupied about it that actually their discourse, and at, in the beginning of 2000s, they uh, were uh, a part of uh, um, media discourse, they were still eligible, they participated in elections, they were a part of, uh, um, you know, uh, mainstream. They did not use this, this opportunity to resist to uh, constructing negative uh, image of the 1990s. And of course, uh, media contributed a lot to this process as well. Uh, and um, there were a lot of uh, talk shows or, you know, just uh, media news uh, that reminded about uh, negative aspects. Uh, I believe that it was just an important part of legitimization of uh, Putin's uh, authority and his political course by constructing their position between then and now. Thank you, thank you, Olga. Um, well, I just want to come back to you with the with the, this question as well because I know you've written on it, and you, of course, are going to come at it from a from a slightly different perspective. So, sort of what are your thoughts on on why this um, this this framing of the nineties resonates with the public, or, or do you feel like you already answered it in your first answer? Well, the nineteen nineties brought uh, both an economic shock, uh, which I talked about, but also a shock to to Russians' collective identity. And Olga's already mentioned the, the brilliant work that Gulnaz has done with respect to the 1990s and collective identity. Uh, I would like to just kind of emphasize uh, and, and encourage people to read uh, her book, Red Mirror. What, Bor what Boris Yeltsin launched was seen by most Russians by the end of the 1990s to have failed. Um, the shock of the 1990s helped solidify a more illiberal worldview, anti-market, anti-democratic, and pro-imperial. Putin didn't create that worldview so much as exploit, I think, what was already there. There's a, there's a hypothesis from social psychology, the impressionable years hypothesis, that states that one's life experience in young adulthood uh, leaves a more lasting impact than life experiences from other stages in life. In the Russian context, I like to think of impressionable years in a slightly different way. Reading through oral histories and, and anthropological studies, so many of them point to the years right around the Soviet Union's collapse as having an enduring impact on Russians' worldviews. Russians in the early 1990s were learning lessons about how a market economy with private property functioned, about how democracy and free elections functioned, and they were drawing conclusions and forming beliefs. So rather than thinking about impressionable years from the standpoint of young adulthood, I like to use that phrase to refer to this transitional stage of history in which all Russians, regardless of age, were prone to form enduring memories and beliefs based on their own life experience. I, I published an article recently in which I honed in on particularly the, the years from 89 to 94. It's a period that covers the last three years of the Soviet Union and the first three years of an independent Russia. It's bracketed on the one side by the loss of Soviet control over Eastern Europe and on the other side by the privatization of, of Russia's industrial base. 
that uh, that same 2006 survey, the EBRD survey that I mentioned in my first response, they also had a retrospective question asking respondents about major life events in each year starting in 1989. And you can actually track individual lives over the 18 year period between 89 and 2006, finding out which years people lost a job in, which years they experienced big pay cuts in. And what you can do uh, with some statistical software, control for a whole lot, host of individual characteristics, the people who experienced economic hardships in those transitional years, right around the collapse of the Soviet Union, had these more illiberal views still in 2006, less supportive of a market economy, more skeptical of a democracy. Those were views that were in place again, largely before the more elite narratives of the 1990s really got going in an active, in an active way. Um, in none of the former Soviet countries do you see that pattern. The reason I think may have something to do with, with Russian suffering, the Russian's economic suffering in the early 1990s being compounded by a psychological blow that only they suffered. And this goes back to a point that Michael was making about how loss was suffered differently. Uh, the loss of the Soviet Union was uh, felt differently, um, reacted to differently by Russians compared to, uh, to others. Um, for Russians, identification with the Soviet Union was much stronger than it was for the peoples of other post-Soviet states. The Soviet Union's collapse was for Russians experienced more as a psychological loss and the twin shocks, the economic one and the one to Russian sense of collective identity is what made the 1989-94 period the impressionable years. With my uh, colleague, Michael Alexeyev from the Indiana University, we've been looking at Russian public foreign, uh, the Russian public's foreign policy values in a comparative way. If Russians didn't, don't suffer from something like what some have called a post-imperial syndrome, if they don't despair over the loss of Russia's imperial status, then we shouldn't observe unique patterns in how they answer questions about foreign policy and the costs they're willing to bear to achieve foreign policy objectives. But that's not at all what we find. Uh, and here I'd like to make a distinction between two types of patriotism. One type of patriotism is more benign. It's about simple pride in one's country. The other is more aggressive. It's about bl uh, blind support of one's country and a more hostile orientation toward others. The International Social Survey Program has been asking questions across a large number of countries over the past several decades to get at just that distinction. Russians aren't exceptional with respect to their degree of benign patriotism but they're real outliers with respect to aggressive patriotism. Questions like people should support their country even if they know it's wrong, or my country should follow its own interests even if this leads to conflict with others. Russians have been aggressively patriotic in the Putin years in the 2000s, but they were also aggressively patriotic on the same questions relative to people from other countries back in the 1990s. So you can't attribute that aggressive patriotism in the 1990s to nar media narratives that began to develop in the, in, the, in the Putin years. And I would again say this is evidence that Putin has less reshaped Russian attitudes than exploited those that were already in place and popular. Okay, yeah, I think that's a, that idea of the sort of the co-creation, the co-construction, um, I think, um, it's a really important one, and that's really, really interesting about the sort of the the survey you were just um, saying about the sort of the benign and the more aggressive forms of patriotism already being there. And it's always that interesting um, question, I suppose, that chicken or the egg, you know, is this something that's sort of come from society to which the government's responding, or is this something that the government has sort of um, put there and then people actually quite liked it and just very difficult, I think, um, to, to find that um to, to find sort of i suppose well whether or not it's the chicken or the egg again um we only we have a couple of questions already in the chat um if anybody does want to add in some more questions um please feel free we'll probably go to questions about five or seven minutes so i might ask people i might ask the speakers to just keep your answers relatively brief for the next um few questions so we have time to ask these I also would note that I've put in a link to Will's article that he just referenced and to Olga's article that she referenced and that I referenced um, earlier in the discussion as well, um, in, that, that are both looking at, at the 1990s. 
Um, so Michael, if I just quickly turn to, to you now, um, obviously the view um, predominantly sort of in, in, in the West, not of everybody, but predominantly is uh, highlights different aspects since remembering the 1990s. And often you see this sort of framing of, you know, Putin took Russia away from, from democracy um, and away from the sort of more, more positive past. Is that, um, do you, is that a fair description of the West's view of the 1990s in Russia? And, and how has that view impoverished or even prevented the West's understanding of, of Russia and of Russians? So, Yes, I think that is, broadly speaking, the West's uh, view in, in, in this regard would make um, uh, three points as briefly as, uh, as possible. Under, under the following rubric that what the West discovered to its own detriment after the end of the Cold War was its own innocence. Uh, and as we're speaking about myths that function in Russian politics, this is, I think, a Western myth of, uh, of its own innocence in regard to Russia. And I would express this in the following way that um, with sincerity, there was a strong commitment to Russian democracy in the 1990s. And you see this, especially in the kind of institutional network that was set up inside of Russia about rule of law, about voting, you know, national endowment for democracy. I mean, there was a sort of a, 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 a big push in the 1990s from the US government and from other European governments, uh, in a sense, to give Russia the gift uh, of democracy, and I wouldn't speak very critically of this in retrospect. I think that there was lots that was of value of it. But I think the problem with that as a kind of self-conception on the Western part is that what it obscured, and here's my, my second point, is that it's not as if geopolitics ended, or as some people say history ended uh, in the 1990s, and I have the West in mind here. There are some very distinct ambitions that start to build up on the Western side which is in effect an American-led security order uh, in Europe. Uh, and that's most importantly characterized by the uh, NATO alliance. Now, of course, in the 1990s, this is open-ended. You have Putin speculating about joining NATO. You have a State Department memo that recommends that Russia join NATO. I think it's in 2002 that was put forward. So, you know, one wouldn't want to be um, falsely categorical about this kind of thinking. Uh, but on balance, there was um, an extension of Western geopolitical influence uh, eastward uh, in Europe. And that was simply a separate project from the project of democratization. But the project of democratization was the one that was, I think, defining uh, for the West. And again, spoke to the sense that we are innocent actors uh, in all of this, benign actors, benevolent actors, uh, and something like geopolitical ambition is not uh, really what we possess when I think the historical record is otherwise. And here's my third point, I'll sort of be most critical of the West with this third point. I think what developed psychologically was a sense that the West was the parent and Russia was the child. Uh, after all, it's sort of the Soviet Union had collapsed and it had failed uh, and there was a need uh, to remake politics and economics in Russia. And often that could seem, especially in the early 1990s, as if it were being done uh, along Western lines, right? It was time to wear blue jeans and to smoke Marlboro, Marlboro cigarettes uh, and sort of appear Western. But, uh, you know, there's something very corrupting uh, on the Western side that happens uh, in that process. And so you get a consistent rhetoric where it's as if, and you see this very strongly in, after the war that began February 24th, but it's been you know, very present since 2014, sort of we have the job of instructing Russia how it should behave. Now, in some ways, one might agree with that, right? Why not? The disagreement, uh, who in the West likes the war in Ukraine, why not disagree and try to sort of compel different kinds of behavior from Russia? Uh, but that's a very peculiar role uh, for the West to assign itself. And again, I think it speaks to its own sense of innocence, maturity. It's sort of a fully formed part of the world. It has sort of answers to questions of politics and geopolitics, and especially Putin's Russia does not uh, and needs in some sense to be uh, to be educated. Uh, and, you know, I, I haven't written a paper on this, but I think if I, if, if I would, I think I could find a lot of data to support this notion of the West seeing itself as a parent. Uh, and uh, that's not, I think, uh, broadly speaking, how the Cold War functioned. That was a relationship of two, you know, equals that had very big disagreements, fierce, ferocious, you know, uh, violent at times, but there was not that sense that one country was the parent or one side of the Cold War was the parent. The other was the, the student or the pupil. That happens in the 1990s, and I think that that mindset on the Western side is is still very much with us.
Thank you. That's a, that's a really interesting sort of framing um, of it that I hadn't I hadn't um, thought before, but I think makes an awful lot. I think makes an awful lot of sense. I actually did have a couple of final questions, but um, in the question and answer um, from the audience, um, there are audience members who who have phrased these questions in a much more interesting and eloquent way than I would have done. So actually, I'll just go straight um, straight to them. So the first um, question, and what I'll do, I think, is I'll ask. There's three questions, and I'll ask them all um to all of the panel and then the panel can take the questions as as they see fit you can also see the panels see the questions sorry written down in the q a um but i'll read them out just for the benefit um of, of everybody so the first um question is from um Pavel Tivyatkin, and he asks um is the memory of the 1990s used in the current discourse in the wake of Russia's military operation in Ukraine. Some Russian scholars have started describing the operation as an exist existential threat to Russian civilization. To what extent is the memory of the 1990s instrumental in discussions of this existential threat? And then there's two very interesting questions um, from Christopher McCulloch, who also um, so he, he asks, can you talk about the role of crime and violent crime, contract killings, car bombs, um, and and their, that the role of crime in people's perception of the 1990s? Um, as someone who lived in Moscow in the 1990s, Christopher McCulloch says that this seems um, that this was the most disconcerting part for most people. And he also asks, do you fear that um, negative outcomes of economic stagnation in the 90s and their role in shaping Russian identity may actually be reinforced as a result of Western sanctions, um, you know, and a doubling down of Russian nationalism, loss of faith in the free market, or will sanctions create the intended consequence of isolating Putin, Russia, and limiting their war chest with little collateral damage? So some big questions there, I think. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to start or if anybody wants to sort of start, if Olga wanted to start perhaps answering Pavel Zivyakin's question or any of them. May I try? Yes, please do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for uh, very good questions. I'll try to answer uh, to Pavel's question. Uh, well, uh, from uh, my research experience, uh, 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 the uh, issue of the 1990s uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine uh, raised uh, re recently and also sometime before uh, in the following context, there are first there are uh, some people who try to uh, uh, say that Ukraine uh, has uh, done with uh, the difficulties of the 1990s not so good, and uh, in some sense, uh, people in Ukraine uh, are still suffering from economic difficulties uh, similar to what uh, Russia experienced in the 1990s. There is such kind of discourse. I would say it was quite visible uh, in 2014 uh, during uh, annexation of Crimea. Uh, it is quite visible now as well. Uh, and uh, also uh, now, uh, and it's a second occasion where the Ukraine uh, and the 1990s appear uh, connected uh, is uh, mm, uh, the issue of borders. The issue of borders, the issue of, um, uh, I would say, uh, some unresolved uh, uh, concerns about uh, identification, citizenship, uh, and uh, all this stuff. Uh, and probably I also give small uh, answer to the question concerning crime and how it was experienced. Uh, I would say I, 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 I agree with uh, Michael's idea that, that oh, there are different ways uh, to experience uh, the loss of the Soviet Union. And actually, there were different ways uh, to experience difficulties of the 1990s. I would say that the issue of crime is, was very visible in media, and also it was very well developed uh, uh, in cinema. We have uh, a lot of movies, uh, you know, like Chicago Gangsters and, uh, you know, Banditsky, Peterburg, uh, things like this. 
Um, so uh, it's something that uh, is a kind of uh, visiting card of the 1990s. But as uh, a person who lived uh, in the 1990s in Moscow and who traveled uh, uh, in central Russia, uh, I should say that it was not a part of everyday experience of every Russian citizen. Probably some people had this experience, but definitely not everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for, for busting the, um, the Banditsky Peter myth, um, <laughs> um, or the Bandit Petersburg myth. Um, Will or Michael, would you like to come back on um, any of the points relating to crime or, or Michael? So uh, I'll skip over crime. It's not really my, uh, my department. I just take the first and the third uh, question. Let me just be pedantic for a moment. I think it would be historically way out of line to present the 1990s as a period where Russia faced existential threats from the West. I mean, I think if you go back to the Cold War, it's 1961 is a very dangerous year. 1981, 1982, those are years when you came, you know, there was sort of Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, sort of coming close to nuclear conflict. In some ways, the 1990s was probably for the US-Russian relationship, the golden age. So you never had so many meetings between a Russian president and a uh, American president, lots of treaties, lots of work that was done uh, collaboratively between Bill and Boris, between Yeltsin and, uh, uh, and Clinton. And so it's in a way, uh, you know, it's always possible to misread history, but it's a misreading of history to say that this is a decade in which Russia faced existential threats and then to base that claim uh, in, in 2022 on a sort of uh, image of the 1990s possible, I suppose, but to me it seems sort of uh, far-fetched. So I think what's more relevant is that 1990s, when it comes to pride, is a, is a difficult decade for Russia that is connected to NATO expansion, that is connected to Western foreign policy in the 1990s, which is certainly resurgent, self-confident, uh, expansionary. Uh, and so to kind of rewrite the rules of the 1990s as a 2022 project, that makes sense to me, but to frame it as a kind of return of an existential threat, um, again, I just, I, I don't quite see the fact lining up uh, in, in that regard. When it comes to sanctions and Western policy and what the aim should be, since this is a panel about the memory of the 1990s, I'll just, you know, sort of conclude my remarks today with, with um, you know, sort of two ways of looking at the 1990s, the, the bad way and the good way. Uh, the bad way is looking at it as the decade that follows Western victory in the Cold War, uh, when uh, victory entitled the West to certain things, uh, and impose certain realities uh, on, uh, on Russia uh, and sort of guaranteed in a certain sense to go back to my earlier point about the parental role of the West that Russia would come to resemble the West uh, and finally Russians would sort of become Westerners and then there's great disappointment when that doesn't, uh, when that doesn't happen or doesn't happen along preferred uh, lines. So framing that as, a, as, a, as, a, as the decade, the crucial decade that we have to return to uh, because that was the time when everything was going right um, uh, is, I think, uh, uh, at the very least problematic in the current context. And, you know, I do think that the West has to wean itself, wean itself off of this notion that it won the Cold War. It's been very um, damaging to, um, to Western self-perception and to, and to the policy formation uh, and the policy formation within the West. And so my final point would be that there is a good way of remembering the 1990s that is, I think, very relevant to the present moment. And this is as a decade of astonishing openness, that the borders really did open and the chance to sort of go back and forth, to live in Russia for Westerners. It was easy in the 1990s and hundreds of thousands of people did or for Russians to travel in Europe in ways that would have been much more difficult during the Soviet period. That created bonds of affection uh, and interconnection that very much exists in the present day. That's in some respects the anchor or the ballast. Uh, of the West relationship with Russia and of Russia's relationship with the West. I don't know how to configure all of that now with sanctions and different policies that are coming from different sources, but let's remember that period of openness uh, and see if there isn't a way of inching back to that uh, because that's you know the most positive uh, aspect of the 1990s uh, and the one that's paid really very great dividends uh, over time. So if sanctions are necessary, uh, they're necessary, but don't celebrate sanctions as something that closes things down remember the value of, uh, of what the world looks like when openness is you know, sort of on the march. Defense of openness, that's quite lovely. Um, at risk of, of breaking the fourth wall, um, I also just want to come back to, to Pavel's point around the, the sort of discussion of the 1990s is existential, um, because I think 
it seems to me, and, and Pavel can correct me if I'm wrong, and I'll just be very brief, it seems as well that this is a reference, um, those who are making it, this reference, um, are talking about a sort of geocultural existentialism, and it's this, this almost like Patrushevian language that we saw in the in the national security strategy in 2021, as well, this idea that the West presents some sort of civilizational threat to, to, to Russian culture. And I think um, ultimately that is language that however emotive it might be, is not is not necessarily grounded and doesn't need to be grounded in objective reality. Yeah, thank you, Pavel. Yeah, I understand. Um, <laughs> that's what I thought you might be referring to. And, and of course, there are several other such articles. Um, anyways, um, it, I'm the moderator, so I should now hand back over to Will um, to hear your answers um, to, to the questions. So uh, you took the questions down, uh, Jade, so I'm not sure if I remembered the third question correctly, but let me start with what I think was uh, the second question about, about crime, which was something that we hadn't touched on. Um, uh, okay. 1990... oh, so sorry, just to interrupt, just to tell you the third question, I just shifted it to the answered section, um, but it's just um, about whether or not sanctions will um, essentially reinforce um, this memory of the 1990s and their um, seemingly negative role in shaping Russian identity. Okay, excellent. So, um, first of all, with respect to crime, uh, the 1990s were, have been a very useful foil, as, as we talked about, for, for Putin, uh, particularly in the first decade of the, the new century. 1990s were a period of economic collapse. The early 2000s were a period of, of economic growth. And another dimension of that comparison is what was happening with with crime rates particularly murder rates uh they were very high spiking up uh in the 1990s and then they then they declined quite dramatically in uh in the 2000s and both of those things the economic growth and the decline in crime kind of fed into this narrative of, of putin that he was a guy who was reestablishing order bringing stability and and growth uh of course he had the good fortune of of um, of uh, assuming office at a time when oil prices uh, were beginning to uh, to run up, and and that that contributed to the, the growth part of of the story. Um, in terms of whether sanctions are reinforcing kind of the narrative of the nineteen nineties, I think the uh, the sanctions allow Putin to kind of um, play on this narrative of it's us against them. And uh, to the extent that uh, it, the West was seen as the aggressor, the initiator of the tensions in Ukraine, and there's a lot of polling evidence uh, from, from Russia over the past year, who is to blame for these tensions? And Russians are, are overwhelmingly uh, of the belief that, uh, that it's, it's NATO, NATO expansion, that sort of thing. And so the sanctions, uh, can allow Putin to kind of continue with that narrative that the West is trying to damage, humiliate, uh, um, punish, uh, bring us to our knees, that sort of thing. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think Russians' um, tolerance is is unlimited. The sanctions are going to cause very real pain. Now, they're only beginning to bite. Russia had become very dependent upon imports from uh, the EU and uh, the rest of the world much more dependent than uh, most other large are most most other large countries, and there there's sectors that will run out of spare parts that will have to figure out how they're going to continue to operate uh, in the absence of imports from uh, in the absence of imports from from outside, and so the sanctions over time will really begin to bite, and and that narrative of um, Stick all stick together. Uh, all stick together in Russia will become. Uh, it will have less less resonance as, as Russians begin to to uh, push back against the the economic hardship that's caused. And also, there was a really good article that came out the other day about um, Russian mothers uh, as the body bags uh, begin to come home uh, as well as the costs both in blood and treasure begin to accumulate. I think uh, you'll begin to see. Uh, the Russian uh, public slowly, slowly begin to pull, uh, pull away from, from Putin. Thank you very much. I just find the article that you're, that you're referring to. Is that, was that the one that was in Bloomberg? Uh, 
um, by, yes, by I think that... career. Well, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. I was trying to find it. Here we go. Um, what was that? I'll just put it in the chat for everybody. Um, Because it was it was mothers in the case of uh, Afghanistan and Chechnya that uh, that really were the kind of the, the leading edge of the, the uh, social unrest and and a pushback against um, the war efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so I put that in the chat now. Now on that note, um, sad, obviously very sad note. Um, I'm afraid that our time is up. Um, it was very, it was short, but very, very sweet. Um, thank you so much um, to all three um, of, of our very distinguished speakers for joining us. It's, I've really, really enjoyed this discussion. I've been looking forward to it for a while. Obviously it's a research interest of mine and it was really excellent to explore from these three different perspectives and we're three um, people as, as knowledgeable as, as you are. So thank you so much for your time. And also thank you to the audience, especially for the really interesting questions. Um, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.